Hi, it's Sarah Carter here, dropping in on the Produce Like a Pro channel, where today I want to talk to you about Mixbus plugins. In this video, I'm going to go over the plugins I use on my Mixbus on every mix. Now, I've been using this plugin chain for a few years now, and today I want to go through each one and explain what they do and why I use them. I'll start off with some raw, unprocessed multitracks so you can hear what each plugin is actually doing in isolation at the very start of a mix. Then I'll demo them on a finished full mix. These plugins don't change regardless of the style of music I'm working on, and each one is there as part of my two phase finisher mix bus system. So let's jump into it. Okay, so the mix I've got here is not finished. In fact, it's not even started, to be honest. So the reason for this is because I wanted to use a really simplified session layout rather than my usual, more complicated template so that you can hear the Mixbus plugins without being colored by any other processing that might be happening before the audio gets to the Mixbus. I normally use buses as like a gathering place and treat them almost like one sound, almost. But in this session, I've left those out because obviously there's a lot of coloration goes on on those buses and I, and I didn't want that to take away from these plugins and what they can do. I like to think of audio like water in that it always flows downhill. All my tracks filter through various collection points, those buses, as it makes its way to the mix bus and I apply EQ, dynamics and effects all along that path. And the collection point that has the biggest impact is my mix bus. The plugins I use are in many ways the starting point of my mix because they're always on right from the start of the mix. So they're always colouring the sound in some way and therefore impacting on my mixing decisions once I get started into the nitty gritty of the mix. I like to think in broad strokes initially and get the most bang for your buck, if you like, by using the group buses and the mix bus to apply EQ, compression, etc. And then if I feel as though I need to dive deeper into a particular sound, then I can go and find that at the track level and fix it. And for me, the mix just seems to happen quicker this way. And it's also a really popular way to mix. But before I get going, if you want to use these tracks yourself, then you can download them for free from the Pro Mix Academy website. Just look for the Mixing Indie Rock course by Phil Allen and the link will probably find its way into the description below for good measure. So here we are at my mix bus and you can see that I've got more bypassed at the moment. But as I said on this session, I haven't done anything massively to these multi-tracks. These are how they have been imported in. I've changed a few levels just so that things are balanced a little bit better and not too overpowering for us to just listen to and audition the mix bus plugins. The instrumentation is pretty standard, straightforward, drums, bass, guitar, harmonica and vocals. Where I have applied treatment, I've done it really only on the kick and snare. So we're just coming in at the point, the very start of mixing for me, where all the tracks are in. I've done a tiny little bit of correction. So let's have a quick listen then see what we're dealing with here. I'll start from this uh, second verse. Okay, so that's it. Raw as you like. Not much in the way of panning a little bit, maybe just for interest and certainly not much in the way of EQ at the moment. You'll see I use a rear bus, but at the moment I've got that muted. I've got nothing rooted to it anyway, and I wouldn't have at this stage in the mix. My mix bus plugins do their work for me in 
phases or stages. And the first phase is what I'm going to call the mixed glue phase. Now, you hear this term used a lot, and to me, it means bringing a certain cohesiveness to the mix, and it's the thing that makes it sound like a record. I use three plugins to achieve this glue, and the first one of those is the 33609 compressor by Neve. I always start with this active and with the threshold fully open so it's not compressing, but it is actually still colouring the sound. It might even actually be compressing a little, even though the needle isn't moving at this stage, but it is subtly compressing. This is kind of regarded as a modern compressor by by studio standards because this was introduced in 1985. So looking at the interface, you've got the limiter to the left here and you've got the compressor settings uh, more in the middle of the box. But in the circuitry, the compressor comes first and the limiter works post compressor. Now this is kind of regarded as being a really great mix bus compressor, although it works on anything really. But it's known for mix bus, uh, piano, vocals, bass, But I only really use this on my mix bus. And as such, I run it at typical settings for that type of application. So for me, that is going to be a low ratio, the lowest ratio I can uh, can get on a compressor. And on this, it is 1.5 to 1. And then I set the recovery here at 100 milliseconds. The recovery is the release. The attack is controlled by this uh, flick switch here. It's, it says fast attack and slow, but really there's not much difference between the two and they're both fairly fast. So um, I just tend to leave it in that fast setting. And then uh, the, on the recovery, you've got these sort of automatic recovery settings here, A1 and A2. A lot of people swear by them. I just tend to stick, stick to the 100. To be honest, this is something I picked up from Andrew Sheps. And if it's good enough for him, then it's good enough for me. And the plugins that feature on my mix bus are kind of a mix up of what Andrew Sheps and Chad Blake have used. And so I've just kind of taken on board what they've used, tried it myself, liked it, and then maybe kind of tweaked it so that it works for me and for my sessions. And that's something I encourage you to do. Nothing is a secret. The pros don't keep secrets. So, you know, take the information and use it in your own mixes and tweak it as you need to. So when I open this up, it's generally um, unbypassed or as it will, all of these will be unbypassed when I first start mixing. But today I'm going to go through them in turn. So I will start with the threshold fully open as it is now. Play the mix. Uh, There's a little bit of gain applied to make up for any compression that might be happening. But I'm looking at the meters here and really this needle will only be just barely moving. Some people will use it much more aggressively than that. I say aggressively, but it tends to be about plus four seems to be the maximum that people will go to with this on the mix bus, but it just sounds a bit bit too much for me. So I just like it really gently working, just touching the mix as it's coming in. So if I'm looking at this meter and it's already kind of pegging into four at plus 10 here on the threshold, I know that I'm really, my mix is really way too, way too hot. And the reason for doing that is because What I like to do is just have these all set with the same settings. So I'm not fiddling and tweaking from scratch with every mix. Ideally, if I get the mix coming into this compressor at the right level um, on the meters here, then it should all kind of stack up after that. And I like to apply dynamics treatment in stages. So I'm on the original track, a bit on the subgroup, and then a bit more on the mix bus. And I find this process makes for a very glued and cohesive result rather than relying on one or two compressors or a limiter to do all the work. I have a thing with mix bus compression and any compression that occurs before it is that it's multiplicative. It's a long word. What does it mean? Well, let's say you have a two to one ratio on a drum bus compressor further up the stream. Okay, and going into that, you might have a compressed snare or a kick at, say, four to one. And what that will result in at the drum bus is it being compressed at eight to one in total. So then when it all filters through the mix and gets down to your mix bus compressor that's sitting at 1.5 or two to one, that multiplies it again to 16 to one. So 
You see, a little applied in stages goes a long way. And I tend to use low ratios on bus compression because of this to avoid over compressing and sort of flattening out and dulling the mix. So you may see some uh, mixers using four to one on the mix bus, which is fine because it totally depends on what they're doing upstream. So nothing is right or wrong. It really depends and ultimately depends on what it sounds like. And the final reason why I use this compressor is for its tone and its character. It's been used on so many records. It's just what people are used to hearing. So it makes my mixes sound more like a finished record. OK, let's have a listen to it and see what it's doing here. I'll, I'll bypass it for now. I'll start playing the mix. It, when I unbypass it, it will sound louder because I've got a little bit of gain here already dialed in, ready for the tiny bit of compression that's going to happen. So what I'll do is I'll just I'll play the mix, unbypass it, and then just pull the threshold down until I start seeing some action at the needle here. Okay, so that's typically what I would do. I don't want to see much going on here. I know from experience and my mixers that I usually end up running this threshold around about that six to eight dBUs here. But let's uh, let's unbypass that then. Let's power it off there and let's have a listen to it in and out of the mix. So I'll start with it powered off and then I'll bring it in. OK, so you do get a little bit, a tiny bit of a volume bump. But what I do hear are things just kind of thickening up and it's giving me that gluing effect that I'm talking about. And to all intents and purposes, it looks, according to the meters, it's not doing anything, but obviously it is. The next plugin that I use is yet another compressor, and this is the Fairchild 670. This is another one of those mix glue plugins for me. Now, the way this is set up is it's only dialed in at 50%. And the threshold is actually at zero. So there's no compression happening, but there's a lot of kind of input gain. And what that does is it adds color. It's forcing more signal through the circuitry and it starts to just give it a little bit of warmth and a tiny bit of thump. I'll leave the 33609 in. I'll unbypass the Fairchild, I'll switch it out, and then uh, I'll play the mix and I'll switch it in. Yes, yeah, so it's just sounding more rock and roll, more 70s. Uh, it's really adding to the vibe of this record, which has kind of got a Led Zeppelin-esque feel to it. So this is just sitting there for that extra tone boost rather than compression because it's not, it really isn't compressing. So next in the chain then is a tape machine. This is again all part of that glue factor phase of my mix bus where I'm chasing that sort of sounds like a record vibe. And I generally have two choices here. After I've listened to the multitracks, I might make a decision where I feel as though I want something that sounds more hi-fi and clean and bright. And then I would go and use the ATR-102, which is the Ampex tape machine, which is predominantly known really in the mastering world. And a lot of the controls are the same on here as they are on the Studer 800, which is what I normally end up defaulting to on my mix bus. So it's only really on rare occasions that I will use that is if I ever get really dark sounding tracks sent to me. Now, I didn't work much with multi-track analog tape when I worked at the BBC, but I do recall the corridors of Maida Vale being littered with these studio machines uh, that had been cast out of the studio and they were just were rarely used. It's quite sad to think of them all abandoned like that. Now, I know a lot of uh, well-seasoned engineers out there I've lost no love over tape and that's completely fine. I, but I think I've been kind of bitten by the nostalgia bug, I think, 
And coupled with the fact that I actually quite like what they do, obviously, as I wouldn't have one on my mix bus. So this Studer A800 then, what I've got it set at at the moment is I've got the tape formula here of GP9 selected. I've got the calibration setting of plus six and I've got pulled the input back because um, I know that it's all going to get quite hot going into the tape. I've got the uh, speed set at 30 inches per second and the output is dialed up to make up for the volume loss at the input. What you also have here are controls for the different heads that you get on a tape machine. I'm using Repro here, which is normal for a kind of playback scenario. And you have these nice kind of like high frequency, low frequency filters that you can use to really fine tune the sound of your mix. And that's the great thing about the tape machine is it to just to think of it like as a great big EQ unit. Everything it does affects the EQ curve of the sound. And this is where that glue factor is enhanced again in my uh, mix bus chain. It's what takes a mix into the familiar realms of a professional sounding mix for me. So it's really easy uh, to switch through the tape formulas to decide which one you like the sound of. And then you can flick through the tape speeds and the calibration again, just to decide which one you want to run with for the mix. So for me, when I use it, I generally start off just by flicking through the tape formulas because they seem to, ha to have the biggest sound changes to me or be them subtle. And then I decide what tape speed I'm going to go with and then I'll just flick through the calibration to see if that makes any great changes. The different tape formulas here are all from different kind of eras and they all have their own subtle sonic imprint to the sound. GP9 is quite dark, which I think suits kind of indie rock really well. Um, the 456 formula is from the 70s. And what you find with the tape formulas is there are kind of accepted calibration settings that that are standard for those tape formulas. So the four, five, six, I believe the plus six and the plus three calibration settings are kind of normal. And 900 is from the late 80s and early 90s. And you can go from the bigger numbers here on the calibration, the plus 7.5 and the plus nine. And the reason for that is that you can push more onto this tape, this type of tape. And so therefore you can get away from the noise floor of the tape, the hiss, for a cleaner recording. Uh, when it comes down to the tape speed, I generally flick between 15 and 30. 7.5 is quite lo-fi. The tape's travelling slower and that results in a grainier, less hi-fi sound. Typically, it was 30 ips was chosen for things like uh, classical or jazz. Rock, it's more typical to go with 15. But as I say, I flick between 15 and 30. And I tend to stick with 30 uh, on this a particular GP9 tape because it is quite dark sounding. 30 tends to make things sound more hi-fi, have more brightness. So that's my reason for those kind of settings initially. So let's uh, try this out then, shall we? I'll take it out of bypass. I'll just switch it to through. So let's see what this is doing initially to the mix. <laughs> Okay, so loads more bass extension, kick extension, loads of warmth and everything's starting to gel together now. Quickly, I'll just run through the tape formulas so you can have a listen to the difference that they make. it gradually gets brighter as you turn the dial to the left and the choice here all depends on what your original track sounded like so that's the tape type chosen and if you feel as though that's sounding a little bit too warm a little bit too thumpy you can then kind of flick over to the different eq formats here or you can start pulling back on the filters but at this early stage that's not something i would do because i've yet to do all the work upstream with the drums and the bass guitar so 
for the time being, I'm just going to leave this as is and let's move on to the next phase of my mix bus. So this uh, sort of second half of my mix bus so is what I go about adjusting with the mindset of a mastering engineer. These are the little adjustments that go towards helping the mastering engineer do what they do best. So the first plugin on that phase is the curve bender, which I choose to follow the compression in this case uh, to brighten things up because they can start to get a little bit dark sounding following compression and the, the tape machine. Or I'll use it to tighten up the low end, that sort of um, EQ bump that you can get from tape. Now, this is based on the EMI desks that were used in the Abbey Road studios, and they're great for being able to boost high frequencies really quite transparently. They add character and, and warmth, and they're instantly accessible. I mean, you just look at that interface and you know what to do. You know what everything is. It's easy to use. And so I'll use an EQ in this position really for that kind of smiley face EQ that you've heard people talk about where it's good, might have a little bit of a bass boost and it might have a little bit of shiny top end added. And this is something that I will pay attention to more so towards the end of the mix when I might be going to my reference tracks to recalibrate my ears. And this is where I do that final touch. This is going to be in, so it's all unbypassed now. I'll play the mips and then I'll bypass it, see if you can hear a difference. But this is super subtle. But see if we can hear if it's doing anything. I've got the bands all switched in, so the sound is running through all the circuitry. But let's see if we can hear that. Yeah, I can hear a thickness and there's nothing in, everything sitting at zero. But uh, yeah, that's just that just sits there and it's ready, waiting for me to quickly open it up and make any broad tonal changes that I feel the mix needs. Next, then in the mastering phase is the ML4000 by Mac DSP. This is regarded as a mastering compressor. It's a really powerful plugin. It's a limiter. It's a multiband compressor, expander, gate, all in one. And I generally use it to tighten the frequency response of the mix and clean up the low mids. On occasion, I may substitute this for the Waves Vitamin on very rare occasions if I just kind of fancy a change. But generally, I'm sticking with this at the moment. And I have a couple of different settings. But the one I've got it set on at the moment, um, the crossovers I have set up are Thus, their crossover one is at 105 hertz, crossover two is at 385, and crossover three is at 7950 kilohertz. And so this will operate as a multiband compressor within those bands to just tickle the mix and to tighten things up. I'll start with it bypassed and then I'll bring it in. So you can really hear how it tightens up the low end and it pulls a bit of mud out of that sort of that area there. That's where all that muddy buildup usually occurs. Um, I don't use the limiter on this. And again, I only ever use this on the mix bus. I don't think I've used this anywhere else in mixing. So I've yet to uh, fully appreciate what this really powerful plugin can do. What I've got going here in the bands, you can see I'm adding in band one, which is the blue here down low down in the mix. I'm giving it a bump of half a dB. The cut is at, at half a dB in the muddy range. There's a boost in the mid range, which is this large red area here, little uh, half a dB boost there, and then nearly a two dB boost at the top. And here, the shiny stuff, sort of um, 8K upwards. So with that done, next is the Oxford Inflator. So the ML4000 has taken my mix and made it tighter and cleaner. 
And what the point of the Oxford inflator is for me is to start adding level now. And it also adds that little bit of shine, that little bit of fairy dust. The great thing about it is that you can add more level and you, you don't reduce the dynamic range when you do, like, say, a limiter would. It adds presence and punch and you can use it to get your mix louder without pumping or oversaturation. And this is, for me, it's like an excitement booster. And it, it does that by adding harmonics. It just can sound subtle or it can sound full on. But if you're not familiar with this plugin, the best way to start with it is to sort of have it have the curve at zero and the pop up. Tooltips there tell you if you go into the plus range, you get a fatness and a volume boost. And if you go into the negative range, that's where you start to, it only works really quite subtly. So that the loudness enhancement that you do get from it has got this harmonic character to it to give you that warmer sound. So I typically run it up here around about in the sort of mid 20s. Well, from sort of 15 to the mid 20s actually sounds best. But when it's on my mix bus, I just kind of leave it at 27, which I think is where I, I, Chad Blake is where I nicked that from. Now, the problem in demonstrating this for you is that it really does boost the sound. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this output down by about four dBs or four and a half dBs, which is roughly the boost that having the effect at 100% is doing. And then I'll bring the curve up so you can hear the effect that that has. Okay, when I take it out of bypass and it's kind of level matched at the moment, you do hear it sounds brighter and it sounds wider and tighter as well. So let's play now with the curve, take it up to the sort of numbers that I generally use it at. So you could hear it on the kick sounding more thumpy. Let's do that again. So that sounds good to me. And that's generally where I end up leaving it. But the reason for this being on my mix bus is to give me more level. I'm going to play back and then I'm going to take this output slowly up to zero to give you a chance to um, rescue your ears if you need to. Okay, and the reason that we need that level is not only to get the mix level up to something more acceptable for comparison sake when listening to other mixes, but also it's going into this L2 Ultra Maximizer, which uh, is my final peak limiter, as well as yet another level boost stage. The best way to boost your mix volume is to do it in stages and not just rely on one fader or one plugin to do it for you. Spread it out over many and you get a much more transparent result. This plugin adds a little bit of uh, shaping, noise shaping that goes towards that whole thing sounding like a record and giving us that glue. It adds air and it gives us a, a more mid-range clarity and it's great for making listening mixes for your clients if you mix for other people so that they can compare your mix to a commercial release and it's more or less the same volume. This isn't a true peak limiter um, and sometimes I'll actually opt to deactivate this on the mix if I don't like what it's doing. Generally, this will be the case if I want a more expansive or open sound. This plugin is great for pop and rock, any sort of high energy music, but if I want something that's a little bit more dynamic, then I might consider switching this off. And then it depends on the mastering, whether I'm doing it or whether it's been sent out to another mastering engineer to do. And very often what I'll do is um, I'll take this off anyway if it's going to a, an external mastering engineer to give them more headroom to work with. OK, so let's uh, take a listen to this then. I think I'll do the same with this as I did with the inflator 
because it is adding level again. It's adding another three and a half dBs and I don't want to hurt your ears. So I'll start with it bypass and then I'll bring it in. I'll take the ceiling up as well. So all we're listening to really is the uh, noise shaping. I'll start with it bypassed and then I'll bring it in. So you can hear it just the mid range seems to get really clear and it adds a little bit of sparkle and air and punch as well. So let's uh, dial this setting into what I would normally use it at. And I'll do it slowly again so that uh, you're not blasted out if you're listening to this on headphones. So here we go. So that has adding, obviously loudness, but it's adding a sheen, excitement, it's making it sound like a, more like a record, isn't it? So those are the mix bus plugins that I'm using currently, and I have been using for a number of years now. Okay, so now that they're all active, I'll bypass them one by one so you can hear the effect of them as they are taken off the mix. <laughs> So that's how they all sounded on an unmixed track. But to top this off, I'm going to demo them on a finished mix for you. So this is a different mix to the raw mix we were listening to earlier. And I want to thank the artist BP Moore for letting me use the mixing session for this demonstration. And if you want to hear more, then you can check him out on Spotify. OK, so this is his track called A Product of the Environment. I mixed this, I didn't master this, and I've got the session open here for us to demonstrate my Mixbus plugins. Here is the Mixbus, and here are the plugins that you can see looking quite familiar. The only change is that as this was going out for mastering outside, then I separated the L2 onto a separate path so that I could send the artist the limited version as a listen copy, I was able then to print that separately without that limiter to be sent off for mastering. This is a completely different style of music to what we've just been listening to, the last being indie rock, and this is more electronic, neoclassical kind of sound. So I'm going to play this from the where the track really builds and the drums come in. This track is really dynamic. The idea is that the low end sounds thick and warm, yet you have the strings and synths that almost soar above the mix. Let me play it for you now with all the Mixbus plugins activated. Okay, so for me, that is doing everything I want it to do. It's adding the glue to make it sound like a finished record and it's adding level and a little bit of fairy dust and width and a bit more thump to the sound. So finally, what I'll do is just move the L2 up to the mix bus so that you can hear what that is doing to the sound. Get ready again for the volume bump of about 3 dBs. So I'll start with it bypassed and then I'll bring it in. OK, 
Okay, so hopefully you can see and hear how I'm using Mixbus plugins with a purpose. Each one is there to do its own individual job. And I'm using compression for tone, control and glue. And for a little bit more glue, I'm using a tape machine and also getting some added thump from that as well. Then I've got a curve bender, which is my Mixbus EQ. Then I've got a multiband compressor, which is the ML4000 to pull out a little bit of mud and to boost a little bit of the mid range. Finally, for some fairy dust, I've got the Oxford inflator, which is boosting the level and adding some shine and thump. And then for the artist and that little bit of extra polish is the L2 Ultra Maximizer from Waves to cap it all off. So that is my mix bus chain that I've based around two phases of mixed glue and mastering. Now there are tons of plugins out there and it really is personal taste which ones to use. So feel free to explore them and see which ones work for you. As the mix bus is the last gathering point for your tracks, picking plugins that give you some gentle dynamics control and EQ polish is a good place to start. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.